Thank you, everyone. I want to first thank Cassette and Slover Library for hosting this event. I appreciate the opportunity to share excerpts from my book titled Star Point, Hearing in the White House, and subtitled Raising Empowered Young Women uh, Through a Father's Eyes. So to clarify up front, this is not a political book. Um, it is a uh, term that we've used, White House, for our family for many years, and it's really a part of our family story. So we held with it and I kept it in the title. So what I'd like to do over the next 10 to 15 minutes is really to share my experiences in writing a, what I would consider a family nonfiction book. And obviously I also share stories because though it's from my perspective as the author, uh, it involves stories and experiences from my family, particularly my wife and my two daughters. So my, my writing story spanned about seven years. I started in early uh, or late 2012, finished up around mid-2019. And part of the reason for that time period was the age of my daughters. And my family, particularly my wife, said that we shouldn't write a book about raising children until they're actually grown. So we did. My daughters are now 24 and 23. And the book really carries through to them uh, being around 21 and 22. And so that segues into the first excerpt I want to read which is really about the role my family played in generating the content and validating it, if you will. So the first section is from uh, the preface and it goes, uh, my wife and daughters have ensured the stories and details in the book are as accurate as possible. However, as the author, the perspective is predominantly mine, both as a father and head of household. Mindful, any joint parenting effort is a weak but this story is filtered almost exclusively through my viewpoint. From my lens, I reveal a real story. The story is one that talks about deliberate actions to set the conditions for our girls to reach their full potential and realize happiness in all aspects of their lives. It is honest, candid, and straightforward. The contents are not made up, but are based on either facts or best recollection. So, that sort of sets the conditions for the role my family played uh, in, in writing the book. And one thing that if you read the book, uh, you may believe that my daughters are the main figures. Obviously, it's about them growing up from about the age of 5 to 21. But one person you won't find as the main character is my wife. And as we went through uh, writing the book, um, I found that it was important that she get due recognition. Because as I mentioned, uh, it was a we, it was my wife and I raising our girls, but this is one perspective, very easily you could lose track of that. So what I did was early on, I really tried to be very deliberate in recognizing the influence and the role my wife had. So the second ex excerpt I like to read is from chapter one, uh, and it talks about uh, my wife and our partnership. So it starts with, um, in any marriage, the leading and partnering of the parents is a delicate balance built on mutual respect and trust. And as much as I assumed the responsibility to head my household, Bambi allowed it. She trusted me, enabled me, and empowered me. Without such support, my impact on the girls would have been significantly reduced, and this book would likely not have been written. I know all that is written occurred because I experienced it. And collectively, the core four confirmed it. However, I acknowledge all that is contained is not all that occurred. No single perspective can fully capture all the sides of a collective experience. And as the single author, this introduces an inherent slant. As such, Bambi's influence on and within the home was more prominent than what the book documents. Using a matrix analogy, if I was the architect, then Bambi was the oracle. The breadth and depth of Bambi's involvement in each of the girls' day-to-day -day life causes her role in how the family functioned to be underrepresented in the written stories. In more instances than I am aware, my involvement was after Bambi foresaw the situation, preemptively planted a seed for me to act upon and or take initial action until I could more actively be involved. In certain cases, Bambi did things and gave me credit almost always without me ever knowing. She invested fully in the whole of the White House, the energy 
interrelationships and respective individual aspirations. Bambi was aware of my mental and spiritual state and even more so attuned to the girl's mental, emotional, and physical health. She willingly sacrificed professional aspirations for the family. And she freely absorbed everyone's stress and fear while simultaneously amplifying our respective joys and successes. So that was, uh, there's a little bit more in that particular section, but I was really the core part where I wanted to make sure that the reader understood that though a lot of this coming from my perspective, the underpinning and really the partnership was very much uh, along with my wife, Bambi. So that's sort of the precursor. What I want to get into now is uh, share some of the stories with you. Um, and then, uh, as I would imagine any nonfiction book, there's the story that's in the book, and then there's the background or the context that's not captured. So what I want to offer is some of that uh, context for you to understand. So I'll jump to uh, this instance, is chapter three, uh, and it talks about discipline. The section title is Non-Idle Threats. So I'll start in the middle of it. So the first instance was during the four to six year range and after they demonstrated an inability to clean their playroom, so they obviously my daughters. Bambi taped up their toys in their toy box and had me take them to the basement. She explained that if they couldn't pick up their toys, then they wouldn't have it. This lasted a week or so, and then they got their toys back. The second instance, which is the one I wanna talk about a little bit more, was when they were in the 10 to 12 year range, and it followed a similar pattern. In this case, both girls were to fold and put up laundry in a timely manner, as well as clean up before bedtime. Clearly, the lesson from earlier did not stick. Though Jalea had completed her part, Jalen had not. After due warning, Bambi went upstairs and saw the chores weren't done, and the TV were obviously the problem. Though only Jalen was at fault, both were blamed for spending too much time watching TV instead of folding clothes, taking their shower, and getting ready for bed. As such, Bambi decided she would remove this distraction. We took the TVs out of their rooms that night. In a change from the earlier occurrence, they would not get the TVs back. As it turned out, for reasons beyond just that occasion, the girls would not have their TVs in their bedrooms again. So the side story to this one is, if you notice, I talked about they both lost their TV, but Jalen, who's my oldest daughter, was the culprit. Well, this is probably the last edited, fully edited section because my youngest, Jalea, was very pronounced in and clarifying that she was doing what she was supposed to be doing that she she wanted exoneration and wanted the record straight. So we had to go through, rework it so that there was no um, misinterpretation that she was also at fault along with her sister. So that was a, a curious backstory to that particular story. Uh, the next one I'd like to read uh, is going back to chapter two. And this one, a little bit self-explanatory, so I'll add a little bit more after I read it. I made a significant discovery as my family reviewed this book. It underpinned my relationship with both girls during their preteen and teenage years. And I did not know about it, although I benefited from it. Bambi had executed a well-crafted plan to foster a strong father-daughter relationship. She sent flowers to the girls after difficult previous days in elementary school, but attributed those flowers to me. The girls were very appreciative, and so to them, it showed how connected I was with their personal lives and struggles. It caused them to commit to listening to me during my, at times, long and boring lectures. It also set an expectation of male investment that they hold to this day. It proved exceptionally beneficial and goes to the difficulty of pinpointing specific actions or conversations that enable successful children. It also speaks to the behind the scenes power one parent can have in strengthening the other's relationship with their children, although keeping it from the other spouse may not be ideal. So as this one sort of alluded to, um, as we're going through and updating stories and, and getting suggestions, my oldest daughter mentioned to me, uh, mentioned to us in a, in a collective forum that I should add this story about me sending them flowers uh, that one day she broke up with her boyfriend. My response was, I never sent you any flowers. And so she kind of looked uh, bewildered and my wife chimed in that, no, she had done it and she attributed it to me. And yet it was a little bit of shock and awe and um, 
And I had to, I found it appropriate, both the fact that my wife did that, and then that it was discovered during the process of writing the book. And so this next story uh, is also in chapter two, and it's about our family vacation to Walt Disney. So as our first true family vacation, where the girls were fully aware of what was going on, I decided to make family announcements to keep everyone on track. One such announcement was that we would not do the Disney Princess Breakfast. I can't recall, but I'm pretty certain Bambi and I discussed and agreed to skip the breakfast. But somehow the announcement was not clearly heard or understood. The next morning when we were going to our early entry park and not the Princess Breakfast, everyone, including Bambi, gave me side eye. Not a turn back then, but what I got. With the schedule begrudgingly set, off we went to the girls' first ever real roller coaster ride. The ride was the rock and roller coaster, and it was in no way a kid's ride. We got to the ride and the line was relatively short. As we meandered towards the ride, there was vacation tension amongst the women. They weren't at breakfast with the Disney princesses, and it was wholly my fault, and the girls were about to have an experience like none before. Not sure which was more pressing, but the unease was palpable. Since we have recently seen Lord of the Rings, I found it appropriate to cite Gandalf's quote about the deep breath before the exit. And once again, I got side eye, particularly from the girls. As we got on the roller coaster, the girls' apprehension increased, but there was no turning around. The seats were there to be sat. The bar came down and the roller coaster slowly creaked to its launch point. After a few seconds, we were off, and a little over a minute later, we were done. In that time, the entire tone, tenor, and energy shifted. Everyone was smiling, talking about the adrenaline, looking at the picture they took of us during the ride, of which we bought. And just like that, our Disney vacation was on. So the backstory to this one is, when my editor read the book, she noted that there weren't any real fun stories in the book, um, but she knew us and she knew obviously we had fun. And when I reviewed it, I realized that it was talked a lot about raising them to be functional adults and being empowered and, and self-confidence, but there really wasn't anything that talked exclusively about us guys having fun. And so I went in and I deliberately added several stories that just talked about us laughing and enjoying each other's company so the reader can have an appreciation of our family dynamic. So um, what I'd like to close with is uh, one story that's a little bit different than those stories I just gave. So I'll tell you that my book is really a combination of family stories, kind of what I read, and also considerations to be an intentional father. And you know, even though I add a lot of stories and I talk about those, at the core, I kept insights that I gained from over 20 years of being an active father to help other fathers read and, and kind of maybe get insights so that it can help them. And so what I'd like to do is close with really one of those uh, excerpts that talk about uh, what one of my philosophical views are about being a father uh, and raising children. Each one of us has a story. And it usually begins with reference to our biological parents. Whether conceived by accident or planned, naturally or medically aided, in love or in lust, eventually a baby is introduced into the world. Upon arrival, the young child is welcomed by whoever is present at the time. That may be one or both parents who are young or old, excited or worried, prepared or ill-equipped. Regardless of the circumstance, a child's story begins, of which they have no control of their situation, no choice in who raises them, and no idea what good or bad parenting is. Consciously and subconsciously, the mental, physical, and emotional foundation is formed that creates a baseline through adulthood. And this near universal scenario gives a glimpse of the awesome impact of a present or absent father. And in many respects, that's why I wrote the book. Um, I believe that if you talk to parents with older children, such as my age or older, it's a philosophical discussion about what you could or should have done. And what I endeavor to do is to introduce this book, my classes, and my insights to fathers who have younger kids or parents who have younger kids so that they can leverage that over the 15 or 20 years in raising 
their children. So as I said, I think I'm about one time. I know we started late, so I think I'm close to my time mark. So I'll see if there's any questions uh, and I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Eddie. So if anyone has any questions, go ahead and use that chat feature and I'll read them out. Um, I wanna start by saying I love that you read Lord of the Rings with your family. That's my favorite book series of all time. And um, it's awesome that you were able to introduce them to that. I, I first started reading it when I was 10. So that's awesome. <laughs> yes, actually, just that they actually watched the movie. So we, me and wife were delivered. We said, we're gonna introduce movies to our children. So whether they liked it or not, it was, you know, they saw Star Trek from episode one, Lord of the Rings, The Matrix. So we watched um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Superman. So a bunch of movies just to give them that cultural context. Uh, so when they grew up, they understand, stood a little bit of the backstory. So I don't know if they read the books, uh, but I definitely saw the movies. <laughs> well, maybe you can get them with the books later on. Um, have you told people where they can purchase your book if they're interested in reading more? Yes, yeah, certainly. So I have a website, uh, jedwardwhitejr.com. Uh, and on there, you can get access to my class and also by Amazon, uh, Start Point Parenting in the White House, as well as Barnes and Noble. So I try to put it as many forms as possible, and then you can reach out to me directly, and I can see if I can even uh, direct sell to you if we can coordinate uh, time and space. Sounds good. All right, I don't see any questions. So thank you, Eddie. All right, thank you, Jessette.